Okay, Luke. So this week, we're going to talk about a principle that seems to underlie sort of all of modern physics. <laughs> when you go looking at the depths of many physical ideas, you find this concept. So let's talk about least action. What does least action mean to you? Right. Well, the simplest place to start with this is a sort of uh, an example of least action, but a simpler one, which is uh, called Fermat's principle. And what he was wondering about was when light has to travel from here to there, but there's different uh, media that it has to go through. Maybe it has to go through a bit of glass or a bit of water where light travels at different speeds. Which actual path is it going to take from here to there? Okay, so, and I, if I remember rightly, what Fermat suggested, or Fermat suggested, was that light seemed to follow the, the least time path. Right. The, so, so the idea is, it starts here, it's got to get over there. The path that it takes from here to there is just the, the time that takes the least <laughs> the time. The path that makes the least amount of time. And so uh, there's a whole heap of ways it could go. But if you took the path it actually takes and just tried to vary it a bit, you would always take a little bit more time. Okay. So, so there's an analogy that I, I remember right. from when I first learned about um, least action and Fermat's principle. There's this notion of imagine that, that you're at the beach mm -hmm. and you're looking out into the ocean and somewhere off to the side, you see somebody's in trouble. You know, they might be 100 meters offshore. They're drowning. So you want to rush to save them. So what's the quickest way to get there? You know, do you run straight towards the ocean and then start to swim? Now you can go very fast on land, but swimming is relatively slow. So that's probably a bad idea. Do you aim straight for the, the person running across the beach and then swimming in the ocean? Well, then you've got roughly, you know, e maybe equal amounts of beach running and swimming. But if you actually go through and do the numbers, there's actually sort of a hooked path, which you can do, mm -hmm. whereby you have a lot of running on the beach and a relatively small amount of um, swimming in the ocean mm -hmm. that gets you to the, the person who's drowning the fastest. And this analogy, when you think about Fermat's principle, is similar to light when it goes from one medium into another medium. So light, as it travels from air into water, uh, it goes from uh, like air is less dense into water, which is more, more dense. They have different refractive indices. And this, of course, sets the speed at which light travels through that medium. And what you find, of course, is that your light ray travels in a path which is hooked, very similar to the hooked path that you would see uh, on the beach when you try to get the minimum time to get to your drowning person. The light, when it travels from air into water, follows a least time kind of path. Now, that's a weird kind of rule for physics, especially sort of historically, you know, in the time before the scientific revolution, we were happy to try to explain the, wor the world in times of there's some principle off in the future that we'll try to sort of aim at. There's what's called a teleological law. It's, it's aiming at something in the future. But the whole point of, you know, uh, especially thinkers like Francis Bacon was to say, no, we just want, we want laws where... The law tells you the thing that happens next and the thing that happens next in time and next in time and next in time. So how do we tell that story? Well, I mean, it seems like light knows what's going to happen in the future. How do, how do we understand this without having to ask of the light rays? How do they know which way they should go to make it go uh, faster or slower? Well, it's an interesting one, right? As you said, it, it is like light has calculated all of the various paths mm -hmm. and said, this one's the shortest. I'm going to go that way. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, the way that we start to solve this is we need to take a look at another famous experiment from physics, which is Young's double slit experiment, mm. which uh, I know you you know. So would like it's to a very it's a very famous one. It's, yeah. Uh, so um, here's, you start off with a, a source of light and a screen that can detect light, and if you you have a very sensitive screen and a very low source of light, you'll actually start to see the particles of light hitting the screen at particular points. So you can turn things down enough that we know that there's only one particle of light coming out. And then what we do is we put in front of it, firstly, let's put in front just a screen with a single hole in it. And so the light goes through the hole and then sort of spreads out a bit on the other side. And so where the light turns up is kind of spread out a bit. And now the weird bit comes. You put two holes in the screen, two slits, say. Now, it seems like a particle will just go this way or it'll go that way. And so what we should see on the screen on the other side is just sort of an overlap of the ones that went on the right, 
the ones that went on the left. And so we'll see a sort of smearing out. As opposed to what we know from physics is if you send a wave towards a screen like that, even like an, a wave in the ocean hitting two breaks in a break wall or something, the two waves will head out, but then they'll interfere with each other. And so at one particular point over here, you'll have the waves from one side where the, the first wave might be saying wave up and the other one says wave down. So they sort of cancel out. And over here, they they reinforce themselves. So you get a bigger wave at some point, And this will be this interference pattern. The weird bit about the young slit experiment is even when there's only one photon in the experiment at any time, we see an interference pattern. After you send a lot of photons through, the pattern that builds up is this wave-like interference pattern where there'll be lots arriving in one place, right? That's uh, that constructive uh, interference. And then a, a sort of a dark spot light, this, this pattern of light and dark, like the pattern of big and small waves. That's what we'll see. And that's a pretty weird result because what it tells you is lights doing something weird. It's not acting like a classical wave, right? Where it would sort of all arrive at the screen at one time. It's arriving at one place. And yet it's not quite acting like a particle either because for some reason it knows about both slits at the same time. Yeah. So, so it, what's going on? So yeah, this is this quantum mechanical thing. You know, it's effectively traveling like a wave. The the photon effectively goes through both slits, but it, mm. it's detected on the screen as a particle. Mm. There's an apocryphal story about where we go from here, right? So we, we have to assume that, that, that light has this, and I, I don't like the phrase wave-particle duality, but that's what it means. Travels like a wave, interacts with the screen like a particle. Mm -hmm. The apocryphal story about how you get from there to modern physics uh, is that apparently, the story is that a young Richard Feynman is in a class where he first hears of uh, Young's slit experiment. So, so Feynman, of course, will be a key player in modern physics from the 1930s, 40s, 50s mm -hmm. onwards, etc. So he asks the teacher, right, so I've got my screen and I've got two slits in it. What if I put a third slit in the screen? And the teacher's response is, well, to calculate the interference pattern, you have to treat the the wave coming through as if it goes through all three of the holes and then you get a more complicated interference pattern than you would with the two slits. Mm -hmm. Then Feynman said, well, what if I put a fourth slit in the screen? And it teaches, well, kind of obviously what's going to happen <laughs> is that light's going to go through the four and you're going to get a more complicated interference pattern on the screen once you've sent through lots of photons. Then Feynman goes, what if I put a second screen with some slits in it? And the teacher is now starting to get slightly exasperated, saying, well, what you need to do is you need to treat the passage of light like a wave. It goes through all the slits in the first screen and then goes through all the slits in the second screen. And you're going to end up with an interference pattern from the sum of these interference patterns from the, the two screens. Mm -hmm. and then Feynman apparently asks, well, what if I have an infinite number of screens with an infinite number of holes in them? Right, such that there's no screens there at all. Yeah, and the conclusion is that if you're going to follow this logic, right, you, if you keep increasing the number of screens, increasing the number of holes, you keep adding up all of the potential paths that the waves could take to give you your interference pattern. That even if you have nothing between your source and your screen, then what you need to do is add up all of the possible paths that light could take hmm. between the source and the screen, and the resultant pattern that you get on the screen will be the pattern that you observe. Now, I don't want to go into the details here. There's a, a couple of books that talk about the quantum mechanical aspects mm. of this and about how waves add up uh, and how they uh, you get constructive interference and destructive uh, interference such that the resultant path that you get for the light looks like the path that follows the least time mm. to do with the quantum mechanical wave aspect of, uh, of the light. So... Um, so you might say, well, okay, so you're talking about light, right? But what, as I mentioned at the start, is that this notion, this least travel time, is actually part of a bigger scope which underpins physics, mm -hmm. which is least action. Mm. That if I see a physical situation, I can define something called the action, then I can apply a set of mathematics to that action, mm -hmm. which is known as the Lagrangian equations, and then they will tell me how that system evolves mm. right so in 
uh, in classical mechanics, we have an action, which is, uh, we know that in classical mechanics, we have a total energy, which is the sum of the kinetic and the potential energies. But if I take my kinetic and I subtract my potential energy, that's the action. And if I feed that through um, the, the equations given to us by Lagrange, the Lagrangian equations, out come the equations of classical mm -hmm. mechanics, F equals MA, etc. Mm. So this is a that's how it sort of starts in classical mechanics. They discover that there's this way of rewriting Newton's equations, and they have various nice properties to them. It's very easy, for example, to change the way that you describe the system, change the variables, for example. Uh, we're used to doing things in terms of, say, X and Y and Z. Um, but we could also describe where something is in terms of its distance and its direction, mm -hmm. you know, its angle. And within this framework, it's very easy to write down the equations for that. Yep. The thing that's really surprising is, having sort of discovered this different framework, it then starts appearing everywhere. It turns out you can write down the, the equations of a classical field in this sort of framework. So classical electromagnetism, light just treated like a wave in the electromagnetic field. We can write that down in terms of uh, an action and a Lagrangian and we get the equations out the other end that agree with classical electromagnetism. But then quantum mechanics, we can do that as well, as you've been saying. Yes, yes. So you can also write out... Uh, modern physics can be written in terms of Lagrangians. Mm -hmm. So in general relativity, yeah. people will talk about the Lagrangian. They'll talk about the Lagrangian and you apply Lagrange's equations and you get out relativity. As you mentioned, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is all written in terms of the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian of quantum mechanics, if you want to talk about how particles interact, you write out the Lagrangian. And this, mm -hmm. this all stems from the work uh, of Feynman mm -hmm. who, who realized that there was this this link between this notion of least action and how you formulate quantum mechanics. Apparently Dirac had seen it before but hadn't realized its importance right. at the level which Feynman did and how he recast um, all of modern physics. Mm -hmm. It's too big a topic to go into too much detail here. Uh, one of the things that I find uh, surprising, is that the right word, with regards to physics degrees is that students don't get to see this underlying mm beauty this underlying framework of physics until their later years and so they come in and they learned they learn classical mechanics they learn electromagnetism they learn relativity and they don't realize that there's a the same mathematical mm. framework underpins all of it mm. i'm just going to mention a book i'm not going to put this up this is not my book there's this book theoretical minimum by suskind mm. it takes the notion of least action and does classical mechanics and electromagnetism in this book and quantum mechanics in his next book starting from this underlying unifying framework mm. and i think that's a that's something we should consider for for physics degrees now there is one other aspect to do with the lagrangian which i think we should touch on and this notion of symmetries which we'll talk about more but do you want to just highlight what, what we mean so a, a symmetry is as you sort of experience it in everyday life you know a, a a ball a round soccer ball is symmetric in some sense because if you turn it this way or turn it that way it looks roughly the same uh, so where you can sort of transform a system and it still has something in common with the way it was before you have in a general sense of symmetry now these have always been important in physics but once you're in this framework of this of the action of the Lagrangian all, all of this suddenly there's a very nice very straightforward link uh, thanks to a, a mathematician called Emmy Noether. And what she proved uh, was if there's some symmetry in your Lagrangian, right, and usually they're pretty easy to see, uh, often it's the case that there's just some, some uh, coordinate of the system, some description, some, some sort of property of the system that doesn't appear in the Lagrangian, then it's, there's, it's independent of that particular variable. But if you've got that in your Lagrangian, then what she showed is, and showed how to calculate, is there's some conserved quantity. There's some quantity that doesn't change in all the other ways that the system might change. So we're used to things like energy. Energy doesn't change in the universe. Well, we'll actually get to that point later. But for most of the interaction in the universe, energy doesn't change. And that's because time doesn't appear in the Lagrangian, in this least action principle. And so that lovely, straightforward, very powerful tool that you can take a Lagrangian, there's all the physics of the system, 
And if I can find within it a symmetry, then I've got myself one of these uh, conservation principles. That's extremely useful. Yep. Uh, that's definitely something we'll come back to and the question of the conservation of energy in the universe. But let's finish there for today. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs>